Good morning. I'm Lucinda Gabriel, and today we are June 21st, 2020. So let me just start off today by saying Happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there. And, uh, you know, we have the best father we could ever ask in God the Father who is in heaven. You know, in the Bible, I don't know... Uh, where it is, but anyway, I know in the book of Matthew somewhere, one of the first things that surprised me when I read it, it said, Jesus was speaking, and he said to the people, he says, do not call anyone on earth your, your father, for you have one father who is in heaven. And so, you know, we can call our fathers dad or daddy or whatever, but we have one father who is in heaven. So, Anyway, I, I really thought that verse was extremely special. So uh, today, I want to talk to you about the love of God, love of God, the Father in particular, because last week I talked about the fear of God and how we all need to have a healthy fear of God to, to stay, you know, on the, on the narrow path. And, um, and uh, you know, fear is also awe in reverence, recognizing that God is sovereign, He's almighty, and He's the creator of heaven and earth, and, you know, He's everything. So we should not take this relationship lightly. So this week, I want to talk about the love of God. So many people do not understand God the Father and His love for us. Most people think that God condemns His people and that He commands us to obey or be condemned. They see him as a controlling tyrant. And because of this false teaching, many people prefer to believe another false teaching. And that is that God is, you know, has this unconditional love and that he will not judge us one day. So they go from one extreme to the other, depending on, uh, you know, how they've been raised and what they've been taught and stuff. So what is the truth? Who is God? Is he a mean-spirited God who condemns us if we do not submit, as some people are made to believe? Let us look at some of the, the scriptures. So we're going to start with the first most famous scripture in the Bible, which is in John 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is where John, uh, Jesus talks to the priest Nicodemus and tells him that we must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And then Jesus continues in John 3, 16, and he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God so loved the world that he gave his Son. And then it continues, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. So uh, to understand why we are condemned already, if we don't believe in Jesus, we need to go back to the beginning. So all throughout the Old Testament, we see God's love for his people. From Adam to the Israelites, which are the Jewish people today, to us, the Gentiles. You see, when God created the world, then Adam and Eve, in his image, he gave clear instructions to Adam that all the earth was his to subdue. They could eat from every tree in the garden except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because, they did, because if they did, they would surely die, is what God said. The woman, Eve, was tricked by the serpent and ate the fruit of the tree and gave some to her husband, and their eyes were open. In this act, they disobeyed God, and sin entered the world. God put Adam and Eve out of the garden at this point because if they had eaten from the tree of life, sin would have lived forever. So Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel, and then Cain killed Abel. And from that point on, man just became increasingly more evil. And God was actually heartbroken about his creation. And those are the words that I've taken from the Bible. I didn't make this stuff up. 
So God decided that he would start over with Noah, who was a righteous man. God told Noah to build an ark for his family and the animals. And Noah did exactly as God commanded. And then God flooded the, wor the world, the earth, for 40 days and 40 nights. And at which time, everything and everyone on the earth was killed. God felt deeply sorry afterwards for what he had done. So he had made a promise that he would never flood the world again. And he shone a, a rainbow, which became the symbol of God's promise to us. So after the water subsided, Noah worked in the fields and made wine and became drunk. And that's when God saw that sin was not on the earth, but in the heart of man. And so he devised a plan to change our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh, to reconcile us to him, and to cleanse us of our sins and to put his spirit in us. And this is in Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. So it's by sending his only son, Jesus Christ, that God was able to accomplish all of this. Now listen to what it says in Isaiah 53. It says, Who can believe what we have heard? And for whose sake has the Lord's arm been revealed? He grew up like a young plant before us, like a root from dry ground. He possessed no splendid form for us to see, no desirable appearance. He was despised and avoided by others, a man who suffered and knew sickness well. Like someone from whom people hid their faces, he was despised and we didn't think about him. It was certainly our sickness that he carried and our sufferings that he bore, and we thought him afflicted, struck down by God and tormented. He was pierced because of our rebellions and crushed because of our crimes. He bore the punishment that made us whole and by his wounds we are healed. Like sheep, we all wandered away, each going its own way. But the Lord let fall on him all of our crimes. He was oppressed and tormented, but didn't open his mouth. Like a lamb being brought to slaughter, like a new silent for the shearers, he didn't open his mouth. Due to an unjust ruling, he was taken away. And his fate, who will think about it? He was eliminated from the land of the living, struck dead because of my people's rebellion. His grave <coughs> excuse me, was amongst the wicked, his tomb with evildoers, though he had done no violence and had spoken nothing false. But the Lord wanted to crush him and to make him suffer. If his life is offered as restitution, he will see his offspring, he will enjoy long life. The Lord's plans will come to fruition through him. After the deep anguish, he will see light and he will be satisfied. Through his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous and will bear their guilt. Therefore, I will give him a share with the great and he will divide the spoil with the strong. And in return for exposing his life to death and being numbered with rebels, though he carried the sin of many, and pleaded on behalf of those who reveled and made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah 53. This is talking about Jesus. So you see, we read in the Old Testament that God's plan to save the world from sin, because it was written in Romans, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So if we die in our sins, we die for good. But if we believe in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and we repent from our sins and we get born again of water and spirit, then we will have eternal life. Just like Christ died and was risen, so will everyone who believes in him be risen as well. At the sound of the last 
trumpet, it says. In 1 Corinthians 15, 50, it says, this is what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood can't inherit God's kingdom. Something that rots can't inherit something that doesn't decay. Listen, I'm telling you a secret. All of us won't die, but we will all be changed. In an instant, in the blink of an eye, at the final trumpet, the trumpet will blast and the dead will be raised with bodies that won't decay and we will be changed. But in order for us to be changed, we need to be born again in water and spirit because flesh and blood can't inherit God's kingdom, right? So we come back to John 3, 16. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. How much more proof do you need to know who God really is, how much he really loves you? Does any other way or religion have a bigger proof of God's love than the offering of his only son, Jesus Christ? Did Buddha's son die for you? Did Allah sacrifice a son for you? Did Muhammad sacrifice something for you? Did Mary die for you? Did any of the saints or angels die for you? During my quest for the truth, when I understood that no other religion had a bigger proof of God's love than the real Bible-based Christianity, I knew I could stop searching and believe in the sacrifice that Jesus Christ had made for me. Jesus is the way. Just like he said, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. And at the moment, when I chose to believe that God took out, uh, when I chose to believe that, you know, Jesus was the sacrifice, God took out my heart of stone and he replaced it with a heart of flesh. And I have been transformed ever since. God led me to repent from my sins. He led me to be baptized, full immersion on my own faith, to wash me clean of all my sins. And he put a desire in my heart to serve and love only him. He healed my body from every disease and he took away all my addictions. How can any God love you more than that? So I just want to finish with Psalm 103. This talks about the love of God. Let my whole being bless the Lord. Let everything inside me bless his holy name. Let my whole being bless the Lord and never forget all his good deeds. How God forgives all your sins, heals all your sickness, saves your life from the pit, crowns you with faithful love and compassion, and satisfies you with plenty of good things, so that your youth is made fresh like an eagle's. The Lord works righteousness, does justice for all who are oppressed. God made his ways known to Moses, made his deeds known, known to the Israelites. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, very patient and full of faithful love. God won't always play the judge. He won't always be angry forever. He doesn't deal with us according to our sin or repay us according to our wrongdoing. Because as high as heaven is above the earth, that's how large God's faithful love is for those who honor him. As far as east is from west, that's how far God has removed our sin from us. Like a parent feels compassion for their children, that's how the Lord feels compassion for those who honor him. Because God knows how we're made. God remembers we're just dust. The days of a human life are like grass. They bloom like a wildflower. But when the wind blows through it, it's gone. And even the ground where it stood doesn't remember it. But the Lord's faithful love is from forever ago to forever from now for, the, for those who honor him. And God's righteousness reaches to the grandchildren of those who keep his covenant and remember to keep his commands. The Lord has, has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. You divine messengers, bless the Lord. 
You are mighty in power and keep his word. We'll obey everything he says. Bless him. All you heavenly forces, bless the Lord. All you who serve him and do his will, bless the Lord. All God's creatures, bless the Lord. Everywhere throughout his kingdom, let the whole being bless the Lord. So how amazing is God's love for us? Nowhere, like I said, is there any religion, any way that there is a bigger love for us than from God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. It is, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so that's my message for today. You cannot imagine how God loves each and every one. And, you know, if you look back on your own life, I look back on my life, even before I knew the truth about Jesus, <clears throat> I believe in God, like all of you or many of you, you believe in God and you pray to God and a lot of you don't realize the significance of Jesus and that Jesus is God. And, and when you look back in your life, you can see that God has never, ever, 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 ever let you down. He's never let you down. If you ask God for something, he's never let you down. And, you know, there's some prayers that maybe he didn't answer because, you know, certain things are supposed to go a certain way. You know, for example, if someone's sick and, you know, they, they pass away, well, sometimes it's supposed to be that way. God's plan is always better than ours. He knows everything. He's, from his point of view, he sees the big picture. He knows how things should be and how they should go. So he's always going to work things out for our best. And we need to walk in that truth and just trust him with our life. And I want to invite you to get to know the truth of the Bible. You know, pick, pick up a, a New Testament and read the book of Matthew. Start there. I love the book of Matthew because, you know, people say that life doesn't come with a manual. You know, like your parents and you think, oh, life doesn't come with a manual to raise these children. Well, yes, it does. And that manual is the Bible. Everything you need to know about how to live is in there. And I wish I would have known that like way earlier. And it seems to me my, my life would have been so different back then. But God had a plan. He had a plan for me to, to wake me up when he did. And uh, it's never too late. His timing is always perfect. And so it's going to be perfect for you as well. So I pray that this message blesses you this morning. I pray that it touches your heart and it opens your eyes and your ears and your heart to the truth. And I pray that, you know, it just cracks open your heart enough to, to search for that truth for yourselves if you haven't found it yet. So I want to wish you again, happy Father's Day and have a wonderful day. And uh, I'll see you again next week. God bless. Bye-bye.